to recommend to not consent to your nomination for chair of land and natural resources. Uh, it's going to make some remarks. I think there's some other committee members who want to make some remarks too. Uh, before I do, I want to uh, recognize your family. I know it's been very, very difficult for you folks to sit here and listen to all of the testimony and to have read some of the things, you know, online and in the paper. And I know, I know what that's like. I know what that's like to sit there with my family next to me. You've all been very, very gracious during this entire period. Um, we tried to make sure that the hearing itself was conducted in a respectful manner. Um, you know, that, that it didn't get to be personal. Uh, but I, I know it's, no matter how much you try, it's very, very hard to hear these things. And I'm a member of your family who you know. And Mr. Chairman, I also want to say that um, I respect you as a person. I would be your first champion for a state czar for transit-oriented development, for taking the state properties that are along the rail line, for getting the agencies who don't want to work together to work together, you know, to develop the affordable housing and the urban core on behalf of the state. And I think you have tremendous talents and skills, and I greatly appreciate the fact that you are willing to step up and if for some reason the full Senate doesn't confirm you, I hope and pray that you would find a role where you could use your immense talents for the state where you would have so, so many people supporting you. And if for some reason you are confirmed by the Senate and um, move forward and I am wrong in my recommendation and you prove me wrong, I will be the first person to stand up on the Senate floor and to acknowledge you. But let me just read something to explain my vote. And these are notes from Hawaii's 1978 Constitutional Convention. And they were cited by our Hawaii Supreme Court in the Kapa'ikai case, which dealt with a resort development on a coastal area. And the Supreme Court said that Article 12 was created in our 1978 Constitutional Convention. It grew out of a desire to preserve the small remaining vestiges of a quickly disappearing culture by providing a legal means by constitutional amendment to recognize and reaffirm Native Hawaiian rights. <coughs> Sustenance, religious, and cultural practices of Native Hawaiians are an integral part of their culture, tradition, and heritage with such practices forming the basis of Hawaiian identity and value systems. Our task is thus to conform these traditional rights born of a culture which knew little of the rigid exclusivity associated with private ownership of land, with a modern system of land tenure in which the right of an owner to exclude is perceived to be an integral part of fee simple title to land. To me, Article 12 and the other article on the, the public trust doctrine for our state lands and our private lands in our state is the very essence of what makes Hawaii unique. It's not just for Native Hawaiians, although that is, it, it, the host culture is, is the core value and center of our state but it's also the right of the public to access public lands. And this is what our Chief Justice Richardson decided when he ruled that the hotels in Waikiki could not shut out the public by building an impermeable barrier that only the visitors who could afford to stay in it could walk through to the public beaches. That if the public beaches are public lands, then we have the right to access them, the right to access them. <coughs> These rights are not a balance. These rights should not be compromised. The chair of the Department of Land and Natural Resources makes many, many, many decisions within that agency that never reach the board, that never rise to the level of attention of the governor. Every day they are approached 
by people who are competing for the immediate use of resources for their immediate gain or personal desires. And they are the one voice in the cabinet, often arguing with the governor, often arguing with the other department directors, often arguing with the attorney general that something is not a legal opinion, it's a policy call on behalf not only of the public, but on behalf of the resources themselves. And to speak to the fiduciary obligation to the future generations and their rights to access those resources, their rights to have open space. <coughs> Listen very closely when you spoke, both here as well as in the other groups that you met with and, and some of the things were put up on YouTube and, and watched them. And I just didn't see that <coughs> commitment and understanding on these constitutional rights and on the rights and values of, of the resources just in their natural state and how to weigh that against the demands of private property owners for the immediate profit at the expense of the long-term resources. <coughs> so for that reason, I have to vote down um, or, vote, or recommend that we vote against your nomination as chair of the <coughs> resources. Uh, <coughs> it's rather unusual for a vice chair to vote against the recommendation of her, his or her chair. But that's the case today. I indicated early on to our chair that my inclination was to vote for the governor's appointment. And having illustrated that early on, <coughs> We proceeded through this this process, and I continue to feel that way. Some of the things that were uh, revealed in this particular uh, process, for me, were rather uh, curious. The the obvious uh, um, question of your your birth. Uh, participation, but also learning that in some cases macro management would indeed reveal what you've revealed. That in itself is unsettling, but that is the case. I think that uh, uh, what I saw was the strengthening of a movement of advocacy that in the days of Sus Ono or in the days of Bill Payne were not as strong. Sus Otto became a lobbyist, like you. Bill Payne worked for Castle and Cook, like you. But they never had to deal with the type of advocacy that you have had to deal with these past few days, or through this exercise of yours. Now having said that, I believe that the job, if it's so intense and so complex as presented, you will not have the time to undo the protections that we're told you will undo. You will be too busy with this incredible department. And so that's where I pivot to my next point. You're being uh, characterized as a company man, someone who will do the bidding of your company, no matter what it is, good, bad, whatever that means. Well, if confirmed by the full Senate, you will be <coughs> this company man. And if you're very strong in that loyalty, we expect that of you for the state of Hawaii and all of the laws that go along with it. Uh, so, uh, having said that, you've been put on notice, Mr. Ching, one way or the other, from both sides of the aisle, what to do. 
And so with that in mind, I will be voting in opposition to my chair's recommendation to not consent to the appointment of the governor. And I thank you for that opportunity. <coughs> I oppose this nomination because I will feel it will harm the future of our state. And if I feel that way, it's my job to rise above expedience and convenience and have the courage to do so. <coughs> Doing this job and taking seriously our responsibility to be a check and balance against other branches of government can be uncomfortable, but not doing it is inexcusable. Mr. Chang, as everyone has said, and I agree wholeheartedly, is a very nice man, an honorable man with obvious integrity, very likable, and I mean that sincerely. That's not in question at all. If you're confirmed, I will work with you in good faith and with full support. But that's not the point. The question we face, which the Constitution charges us to answer, is, is the nominee qualified and capable of doing this important job? I accept that in some cases I might not politically like a nominee, but they may still be qualified. I don't feel that's the case here. In this case, as an environmentalist and one of the thousands who care so deeply about not only Hawaii's short-term economy, but also its long-term sustainability and unique natural resources, I must speak out against the harm I feel this confirmation will bring. Not just potential harm to the environment and our precious resource, but the certain harm to the public trust in our government. Comparisons to the PLDC have been made and are perhaps unfair, but this is, in my mind, the PLDC issue times 10. Instead of a branch of DLNR devoted to development, we're now looking at refocusing the entire department through a lens of development instead of stewardship and preservation. I learned from that episode how important stewardship of our public lands is to the people of Hawaii. And I'm not sure if we heard the outcry or if we have to repeat the, the lessons of that chapter. I can find no better words to describe the situation than those of Mr. Randy Awo, who after 25 years serving as DNR, culminating as head of DOCARE. The nominee's entire career track has been the polar opposite of DLNR's mission. No one's preparation for this kind of job is complete. Of course, there will be a learning curve for anyone. But we require subject matter expertise in every other department's director. Would we hire a tax director and ask that she learn accounting on the job? Would we hire an attorney general with no legal experience? A transportation director not familiar with transportation? Of course not. Yet in this case, we're asked to approve a nominee with no, with no <coughs> real experience or aptitude for the mission. And in such a complex and important department, the lack thereof is a huge disqualification. Today, we confirmed two nominees, each of whom had decades of specifically relevant experience in the field they were appointed to. To say that such subject matter experience is not needed is to me to display a lack of concern for preservation and conservation. It displays a surprising dismissal of the concerns of those who care about our environment and cultural heritage. It's been said that subject matter knowledge is not needed, but simple management experience is sufficient, and then the nominee can learn on the job but this nominee's management experience in no way compensates for the lack of subject matter ex knowledge. Most of his experience is lobbying and development, not management. The nominee has several times referred to land as a piece of dirt. I understand it's just an expression, but it's telling. 
not as aina, not land, not an important resource, but a commodity to be used and profit, and profit extracted from it. I find this troubling and indicative of the mindset of a developer versus that of a conservationist, or even someone who has a balanced view of such issues. On endangered species, the nominee has told us correctly that we must evaluate, prioritize, and try to save the most important ones. This is true. But to a biologist or a conservationist or a lover of God's creation, there are no unimportant species. Just like pieces of dirt, once they're gone, they're gone forever. Advocacy for groups opposed to preservation and conservation comprises most of the nominee's life experience. He attempts to distance himself from these efforts after a long-standing commitment to them is curious. Claiming that he was unaware of the LERF and BIA's efforts in the exact opposite direction is not acceptable. Once again, uh, Mr. Cheng is a very likable, nice guy. It's clear that he has a good heart and he's good at what he does. But that's not the point. It's not sufficient to qualify him for this job. If there were no better qualified applicants, then the answer is to cast a wider net. The assistance of environmental and preservation community could have been sought. Any of several DNR division leaders <coughs> could be promoted. Several of whom are in this room, several others not in this room. It would result in a boost in morale instead of a demoralization of the department. It would also result in someone with knowledge of the organization, the laws that it operates under, and its core and mission. I again met, referenced Mr. Awo. He was not only one of the most eloquent testifiers we heard, but by far the most qualified. That's right. He describes the level of concern within the department over this nomination as unprecedented. And the inappropriateness of this nomination as being on an entirely different level from any previous nominees and any other previous director. My own discussions with staff confirms this. Support for this nomination, aside from other appointees, comes almost exclusively from the development community. This glaring fact is really as, as important to me and as telling as the opposition from the preservation community. This is not a development department. <coughs> This nomination is anathema to this department's mission. The distrust and disillusionment of those who hope for a more fair, honest, and open government is powerful. <coughs> I need not point out the perception of revolving door among lobbyists and important positions of public trust. We all know how that works, and today we expect better. What do we do with 90 plus percent opposition from the public? If we remove development interest groups and appointees, the opposition is 98%. How cynical and arrogant would we be to ignore this? Mr. Awo described the attempts to marginalize the opposition as irresponsible, and I agree. People who volunteer their time to defend the environment are not special interests. I stand with those who genuinely take the deal in our mission statement to heart. We are united that this choice is not only is wrong, we are united as no other issue other than the PLDC has united us for the same reasons. As Mr. Awo implored us to do, I urge my colleagues to put aside political expedience, do what's right for Hawaii now. If we take our duty to advise and consent seriously, and if we care about good government and public trust, if we care about the will of the people we were elected to represent, we take stewardship of Hawaii's public resources seriously, then we must reject this nomination. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Uh, this is a very difficult process, but it's one that uh, I take seriously, and I think it's the most important thing that the Senate does. First of all, I want to thank the Chair. Uh, for, uh, I think, running a, a fair hearing. 
that went longer than anyone <laughs> thought it was going to. Most of all, I want to thank all of you who sent in testimony or who came in and testified. Because what we're really talking about is the democratic process and the idea to, to have input. Uh, I say every one of us takes this seriously. And we're not marginalizing, marginalizing anyone's testimony. But um, in the end, you have to make a decision. You have to stand up for it. And I've always been one who tried to justify or at least explain what it is. However, when you make a decision, um, you know, half the people are going to be uh, saddened or opposed uh, to what you say. The other half may be in support. I come from the business community. I am a businessman. I'm proud of it. Proud to be an entrepreneur. Proud to try and earn a profit. <coughs> I'm old enough that I can remember when developer, per se, was not a bad word in this community. Because we understood that they created opportunities, jobs, tax for revenues, partnerships with the government, helped the government. Now, that's not to say that there have not been and are not bad developers, because there are. Just like, shocker, there are bad people in elective office. I've tried to be independent since I got elected. I was the worst opponent of PLDCs from the very beginning and voted against it, as I mentioned yesterday. I disagree with the nominee on Coal Ridge. I think it's a terrible idea, just as I do with Ho'opili. I'm the one that fought the windmills and supported the neighbor islands. I think it's terrible. Besides, those windmills may kill our opeapea, a native <coughs> Hawaiian mammal, back. And I don't want that to happen. I'm an opponent of the undersea cable. Terrible idea. Waste of money. So I think I got my creds. <laughs> and as I shocked the lady yesterday, reminding her I was the secretary of the Conservation <laughs> Council of Hawaii many years ago. I say this because one of the issues here today is can a man, can a person come from the development community, agree to a very important government position, and then, as the analogy has been made, change uniforms or whatever? The nominee said, yes, I believe it. Why not? From the very beginning, people have been lobbying me and asking me, well, how are you going to vote? And I have a lot of friends sitting in here that oppose the nomination. And yes, we had a stack like this in opposition. And I was asked from the very beginning, will you support us and vote no? And my answer was then, I will wait until the hearing. That's what the process is all about. To listen to all of you, to listen to him, to ask questions. <coughs> and that's what I've tried to do. Now, a couple of points. The nominee has said on many occasions to derision from some people, that he would obey the law. Gee, if all of us would do that, what a better legislature you would have. Because we don't obey the law. So I think as a beginning, that's an excellent starting point. The other thing is, can he really be expected to give up his friendship with his developer friends and past positions? He says he will. I saw in the nine hours yesterday and today, no smoking done, gun of any illegal activity that he's done, any ethical problems that he's had, any question of integrity or character. But we're not voting on a nominee because he or she is a nice guy, or because as one of the testifiers says, said yesterday, well, he's tall and handsome. I don't care about any of that. What I care about are several things. Number one, this is the governor's nomination. In the years that I've been here, I've only voted against two governor's nominations, and I thought for very good reason. But I think that the governor may know more than many of us. I call to mind the recent nomination of the chairman of the PUC, the Troubled Public Utilities Commission that has so much to do with our daily lives. There was chatter that this nominee had no background in utilities or energy or anything else. And there was grumbling. 
not to the extent that we've had in this hearing. That appointment was confirmed. And within one week, that person who had no experience or anything else, as opponents said, told Hawaiian Electric what the law was going to be and what they had to do in terms of solar roofs, which couldn't be done by this legislature in two and a half years. He did it in one week. When a nominee comes before us and we ask him questions and give him a public colonoscopy, as we did for the last day, <laughs> you have a choice. You can believe what the nominee says or not. You can believe what the governor says or not. And those people that say, well, this is going, if this nomination goes forward, and I don't know what's going to happen on the Senate floor. Don't know. But if it goes forward, it's going to hurt the governor. The governor is willing to take that risk. He explained to you yesterday why he made this nomination. He sat through all the testimony yesterday, and he's sitting here with us today. To me, that means something. But I'm concerned. Everybody talked about LERF, and i got to tell you, I was never that impressed with LERF coming before the legislature or the executive director or his statements. And many times even though my background is in business, I discounted what they said, because it didn't make sense to me. And I think many of my colleagues did that as well. I was a little disappointed that the nominee did not have more of a knowledge of what the organization was doing, <coughs> since he was sitting on it. But that's beside the point. Everybody pointed at LERF. That's one organization. They were close to 30 environmental organizations, most of whom I have a great deal of respect for. And I know about that effort, that volunteer effort <coughs> that folks put in. The Vice Chairman brought up the difference between 1978, the Constitutional Convention, and now. We have very strong and positive environmental laws. We have very strong and positive environmental organizations. If this person is confirmed, you are not going to let him get away with things. But he has told you. He's not going to tear down the laws. I don't know. People came yesterday and said, they're scared. They're horrified. They're afraid. Be afraid of ISIS. Be afraid of North Korea. Don't be afraid of a nominee for this position. Because ultimately, you have shown you do have the power. And regardless of how the final vote comes out, you are going to keep that nominee's feet to the fire, whether it's this one or somebody else. And that's a good thing. And we all will. The days of somebody walking in because it's a political appointment and doing what he or she wants to do, they're over. And part of that is because of you, because of your activities. But in terms of learning curve and, and whatever, I think, first of all, that a number of the statements that the nominee made and the comments he made were taken out of context or were used in a way that while people may disagree, that's not what he said. That's not what I heard. And so I take him at his word. I also heard statements about preservation versus development. And it, it put a pall on all development. If we don't have some good development in this state, we are going to continue to have our economy get worse than it really is. Now, I know the previous administration used to tell us how wonderful things were and how we turned the corner. We didn't turn any corner. You are struggling. I am struggling. I understand that. But it's not going to be government that's going to pull us out of this because government doesn't have any money. Shocker, the only money that government gets is that it takes from you. And so... The idea that an organization like LERF that came in and actually lobbied for developers and landowners' interests, I'm just sorry that they didn't do a better job in many areas. What happened to the idea of free speech? What happened to the idea that we would argue out issues and make our decision? I've had to live with the decisions and the votes. Heck, I come in to vote almost every day, and I'm outvoted 24 to 1. But I still have a smile on my face, because that's the process. 
And it's because we do have more transparency and we do have more input. So everything you say and do is important here. But I asked one of the opponents yesterday if her organization had ever voted against any of the nominees for DNR in the past. And she said, yeah, there were three of them, including Bill Patey. They couldn't stand him because he was a big, bad developer. Is he taller than you, Mr. Chin? I don't know. No? You're taller? Okay, good. And then within a very short period of time, Mr. Patey surprised everybody with what he did. Heck, this group even voted against our chairman for DLNR. And I asked them, did they change after she was in for office for a little while? Well, no, they didn't, but that's beside the point. People not only can change, but those of us that are in public office know that our first responsibility is to the Hawaii State Constitution, the United States Constitution, and any mission statement or ethics laws that we have. And if we violate them in any way or don't enforce them, we have remedies for that. Conflict of interest. <laughs> It's been a joke in the legislature because people get up and say, I have a conflict, and the president of the Senate or the Speaker of the House say, no conflict, and usually they go on. And I tried to recuse myself when I was trying to buy the Star Bulletin, and they don't have a block on the voting thing. They said, oh, just leave the room. They said, I'm not leaving the room, I'm recusing myself. And they couldn't figure out how to do that because it wasn't on the form. This man said he'll recuse himself. Do I disbelieve him? Do you disbelieve him? I don't know. Does he lack many of the skills that many of us would like to see? Yes. Was he weak in some of the questions that he responded to? Yes, he was. But for all of us, we probably have a different vision of who or what kind of person we would like leading DLNR. For me, I'm willing to give him the opportunity to prove himself, knowing that we have safeguards and we have people that will not let anyone go on their own and do damage to the item. As far as being an environmentalist, I think that, you know, a lot of us, older people, are environmentalists, we just don't have the title. Because we grew up with our parents telling us, turn off the lights, don't waste the water, don't put trash here, clean up after yourself, do those things. Those were basic environmental laws. I didn't hear anything or anyone show me that this nominee is not going to protect our environmental laws. On the area of historic preservation yesterday, the question was whether or not he was opposed to historic preservation, and he answered no. He brought up issues and was opposed to certain aspects of a law that was passed here several years ago, which again, I voted against because it made every property historic just because it was 50 years of age or older, and then had negative ramifications if you wanted to take care of your own property and fix the roof or add a room or something like that. And we have several bills this session that we're trying to remedy what everyone now recognizes were unintended consequences. But he was clear on that answer. And yet, some people won't let that go and say he's against historic preservation. Or he won't be an advocate for either increased funding if it's necessary, or increased rules that will help the many divisions of DLNR, he said he would do that. For me, I will give him the trust and the ability to do it. So for those reasons, I will be voting against the Chair's recommendation, but I will leave it up to the entire Senate, and you all still have ample opportunity to talk to all of us and to see how that vote goes. But at this point, as I say, I think that <coughs> while the opposition, I respect the opposition, I think that many people, too many people, as was brought up yesterday, have used labels. 
and have put more importance on those labels than on the individual and on the laws that we have and that all of us in this table and all of us in the State Senate are sworn to uphold. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to support the chair. Um, it's difficult for me. Um, I think, like all of us here, you know, I don't know. I don't know you, Mr. Ching. Um, so it's definitely not personal. And I must say that after getting to know you and hearing about you, I really like you. I'm very, very impressed. Um, that our state needs people like you with business sense. <coughs> you know, I, I myself, you know, worked in nonprofits most of my life, government. I have zero, got some zero business sense, and I know that we we really need people like you in government that can help us um, to really increase our revenues um, and really maximize our resources. Um, and so I, I, you know, I really that's why it's difficult for me. I, I really do hope. Uh, I'm not sure how the Senate's going to vote, the full Senate. Um, if you if you are not confirmed, I really do hope that we can find. Um, a way for you to serve us because your, your skills are very much needed. You know, somewhere, as Chair mentioned, maybe TODs, DHHL, UH, DBED, I think places like that would be fantastic. Um, you know, and, you know, and, and I don't, like I said, I, I don't know you really, so actually, you know, I could be wrong. And, um, and similar to what Senator Ruderman said, if you are confirmed by the Senate, I definitely look, look forward to working with you and, and will definitely commit to working with you um, in good faith on, on all the issues that DHHL, that, that DLNR um, deals with. Um, and so for me, I mean, I just, you know, I, I think it's just, it's just based on a lot of what was said earlier, um, that I think you have great skills. I know you're a great man. Um, that's, that's very apparent and obvious to all of us. Um, I just think in a different department, um, I, I would like to see you. So those, that's my reasons. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to be voting in support of the chair's recommendation. Um, I appreciate the family coming down here, and uh, I can understand that the pain it must be you know, for, for all of you to be here. So thank you for hanging in there for this. Um, when we first met, I had mentioned my first thought to, um, to Mr. Shane, sir, was um, I believe you, I believe people can switch jerseys, as it were. That you can, if you're committed to the work, get in and, and do a good job. And I actually believe that you're sincere and will do if you are appointed a reasonable job. Okay. The question is, is it a reasonable job? Is that, is that enough? Um, the consistency of your answers were commendable. I mean, you, you, but you evaded, you evaded a lot of things. And we were trying to probe down on, on a few things about, well, are you going to be that advocate for the environment? Or are you going to default to, you know, the private property rights things? And, and earlier in the questioning yesterday, I asked about the difference of highest and best use of land. And I was a little unsatisfied with that because I think as far as the position that you're seeking to get, and uh, again, echoing everybody's sentiment, should you um, be confirmed, I, I, would, I would be happy to work with you and support you. But going back to the answers and, and what is the highest and best use of lands, um, it, it was oversimplified. Well, I'm going to preserve land, preserve land, preserve land. I'm going to save this, say that. But there really didn't seem to be any depth in that. And, and, and maybe it's unfair. Um, there was a lot of questions we asked about um, your understanding of the environmental law, and, and you know we didn't, didn't know that too much about the environmental law. The evasions on, on MRF was very distressing because I think that cuts to the integrity question. Uh, I'm, I'm not doubting your integrity, but the way you seem to know nothing about LERP's policies after 10 years um, was a concern. There was a comment yesterday that uh, it's the lens in which you see things through. And that ultimately is, is the deciding factor in, in this, in, in my determination. Um, I do think your, your lens, and it, it, it's not 
wrong for you to have the beliefs that you have and, and the opinions you have, and you should stand up for them. I feel like we're almost asking you to come into DLNR and have to go against your own instincts. I, I feel there is that tension, and that's the tension I think that's been brought up with the um, thousands of oppositions that, that have come forward. I, they, they, they are concerned that, that when you come down to a decision, is this significant or not, how will you make that decision? When we come to water rights, you know, water rights is a really tricky, tricky area. I don't pretend to know much about it, but I know that uh, that's a hornet's nest in itself. On, on, you know, stream flows and pertinent rights and users, and, and how are you going to distinguish that? I mean, as, as the chair of the of the water commission, that that's a monumental responsibility. And again, I I gotta say, I mean, I just think. You might flinch and lend more towards the development side instead of the uh, preservation side when that becomes push to shove. Um, the public trust doctrine that kind of uh, kind of flawed that you know we beat that subject up a lot, but but I think it's it's relevant. Um, it's the perspective in which you bring to the job, and I, I hope if you you know you, you are confirmed that you know that, I hope I'm wrong and I hope everything's going to work out. But I'm going to support the uh, chair's recommendation to not consent. And I have to share one more thing, is I represent a district that <coughs> contains tremendous natural resources. We all do. All of our districts are, are, are special. But the Senate district that I represent is from Kaena Point to Kanemai. We've got bays and watersheds and conservation lands. We, we've got you know, streams and estuaries. And I asked you a question about you know the importance of stream flow and, and what that means to the environment and, and the near shore waters. And, um, you know, there's things that, that I guess you're going to be learning along the way here. Um, but my constituency is very strong on the preservation and keeping. People bandy this term around, and, and it, it's a funny thing when people use it as a, as a, as a jingle to kind of, it kind of wave this magic wand. We keep the country, country. People use this all the time. And I'm very reluctant to actually use that term. And I, I think I've actually earned the right to use it, but I, I'm reluctant to use it. Um, but, but that is a sentiment that is really profound in my district. So if I'm going to represent my district and my constituency and, and, and the kind of philosophy that I have for the value of our natural resources, uh, I'm, I'm going to have to uh, go with the Chair's recommendation. So thank you for allowing me to share that. And uh, whatever may come, I wish you the best. Um, mentioned 1978 CONCON, I'm, I guess the last senator from the CONCON and, and Speaker Bill Suki's last um, House member, and uh, I was against it, of course, but um, it was, I, they didn't dawn on me that how significant those environmental and cultural protections are they're extraordinarily significant, and to me that started the budding but slow movement to, which to me culminated in the PLDC, which really sparked uh, an environmental cultural movement to a, the highest level I've ever seen. And I think that um, the um, amount of opposition and the amount of caring that that represents uh, on, on all sides really, I think, um, speaks well to us as a community. <coughs> um, I um, respect the your the nominees confirmation opponents and their reasons most of the reasons I agree are valid um, and I think that um, their fears are valid also they have a right to be fearful um, maybe, maybe because they don't know you or it's not it's a little unheard in the decades of development wars where the environmental and cultural community often loses uh, and um, I'm usually on that side. Um, <clears throat> I think that justifies um, a, not cynicism, but a disbelief that someone can uh, change Jersey. Someone can, you know, that, that someone can uh, leave a lifetime development job <coughs> uh, and community relations. <coughs> and, um, and then, switch to then be the protector, I, I, I can understand how many people in the context of the development wars, um, I can see how they can believe that 
um, <coughs> that I'm um, what gives an analogy here, not a um, and <coughs> um, the other I think major concern <coughs> is um, the lack of um, competency that to have all or to lack of qualifications to enter the job. Um, I think there is amongst those who cherish um, environmental and cultural protections the most, really, really would want to have someone who uh, is familiar and who is part of that community. So I think if you can understand that it's you know a, a major disappointment. Um, and as they all say, it's, it's not an offense to you. Um, I do, if this was a job interview and we had a few selections, uh, I would not select you. Um, there is, we are, but we are here to fulfill our constitutional duty to confirm, or advice and confirm, or reject. Um, but, and that's our constitutional duty. Uh, so we are where we are. Um, I do believe that the nominee uh, is sincere in his commitment uh, to the governor and the community and, and, and the public uh, uh, in uh, protecting and conserving and preserving uh, our environmental and cultural resources. Um, and Without a track record, we really don't know. I think I read, I think there's a story today, so it's like a leap of faith. And for many of um, many people in the community, it is a leap of faith. Um, I happen to know the governor, and this is not political business as usual. Um, and, but it'll take time for people to understand that, and we'll have to walk and talk about that. But in the context of business as usual, this is a dangerous appointment. And, um, um, and without that track record, there's nothing to rebut that, that concern. Um, so it is, I think there is a certain level of, of um, for a certain um, uh, risk that um, we, if we confirm you, uh, would take. Um, and, and if we confirm you, then you need to really be really a fast learner uh, on the job, and that, that is of concern. Uh, <clears throat> but our choice is either up or down. Um, probably the, one of the most uh, significant question I have is, can you, the nominee, if you're confirmed, um, um, embrace the environmental, cultural, preservation, and so forth community take off the um, uh, land development um, uh, well, or switch cultures in a way. I'm not sure. I asked, the first question I asked of the nominee was uh, really about switching culture, and I don't think you got that, but I think it will take a while, and, and uh, it is to me a, a, a tremendous, tremendous leap. Um, um, I, for me, I, with, with, with the nominee, if he gets confirmed by himself, I don't think um, the nominee can um, make that transition. Um, with um, support from the board, Land and Natural Resources, the uh, Water Commission, um, the governor, the legislature, uh, maybe perhaps even people who vote no, um, and um, even some of those opponents who vote no. Um, I've come to a place where I am willing to accept the governor's nominee, uh, and Carlton Ching. Um, however, um, in light, or to add light to the significance of the um, concerns, <coughs> Um, I will be supporting the uh, chair's recommendation. Um, so on the Senate floor, um, the, the, the recommendation that this committee, from here and everyone, 
will be to not invite to consent. That will be the recommendation on the floor. Um, the Senate rules, however, say that the, the vote will be whether to invite to consent. And on that matter, I will vote yes with reservations. Um, like a few other, like the chair and, and um, Senator Lupo mentioned, um, we will see, if, you're con if the nominees confirm, we will see whether one of us is right. Um, uh, and, and, and if I am wrong, and uh, well, I should point out that we, we did confirm the, the Attorney General today, and he's the only one the governor cannot remove at will, so just so you <laughs> but, um, and I'm sure people will be talking with the governor, with, your, with uh, the, whoever the, uh, the director is. And I, um, I uh, if uh, confirmed, I um, fully expect, and, and I will be expecting a um, su successful uh, term. So, um, I just learned this today, but when we vote, it's a situation where it's a double negative in the committee. The recommendation of the chair is to not advise and consent. So a yes <coughs> vote is a no on the nomination. So it's because it's a double negative. So let me say that again. The recommendation of the chair is to not advise and consent. If you agree with the chair, you would vote yes. What that means is you would be voting against the nomination. If you disagree with the chair, you would vote no. Can I make a technical clarification? Sure. We're voting on what the committee's recommendation to the full Senate. Correct. Correct. Yes. And so, um, as we talked about at the beginning of the process, unlike bills, which may be killed in a committee, a nomination for um, governor's cabinet must go to the full Senate floor for a vote. So what we are voting on today at the committee level is a recommendation that will go down to the full floor of the Senate for a full Senate vote probably early next week. So let me just say this again because it is confusing. The recommendation of the chair is to not advise and consent. If you agree with the chair, you would vote yes. You disagree with the chair and you would vote no. That's, that's very clear. So this committee, through the chair's recommendation, advises the Senate not to consent to GM 514. Correct. Okay. Having said that, chair? Yes. Both sides. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little <laughs> Okay. Vice chair was nay. Senator Ihara. Aye with reservations. Aye with reservations. Mm -hmm. Senator Rivera. Aye. Senator Rudiman. Aye. Senator Shuma Bukura. Aye. Senator Slope. No. Uh, it has been adopted. Thank you. We've got the committee over there. Thank you. So, Bart, you want to say something? You're live on the internet. Uh, live on the internet? Yeah. Um, uh, who wants to hide? Um, I got to say, we, you know, different ones of us had different anticipated kind of results. And um, I had a sense that Les was in a very tortured spot. On the one hand, he has been a, an advocate for strong environmental protection, for uh, protecting the institutions of government from the corrupting influence of special interests. And to me, the appointment of uh, Carlton Ching represents exactly the domination of development interests uh, within state government. Uh, but also, he's a close personal friend uh, of the governor and a closer friend of Mike McCartney, who's shepherding this thing through the Senate. And so I wasn't sure how he was going to resolve his contradictions, his, his conflicts. Isn't that supposed to... The personal part isn't supposed to have any influence. Well, no, it has influence, I think, over whether you trust 
right? So if, if he trusts that the governor is going to be, is committed to a vision that he shares that is different from the The, the governor's developer. judgment about yeah, yeah. But, the appropriateness. Uh, but the way he split the difference by saying that... With Rizzo. He's going to vote yes with reservations here for the chair's recommendation, and then he seemed to be pledging that he would be voting for the nomination when it gets to the floor. Yeah, I didn't expect that convoluted splitting of the baby, you know, yeah. uh, that surprised me. I am heartened by the committee's recommendation to vote against the uh, right. confirmation of Crosby Ching. I was very disappointed in Senator Ihara. Uh, Senator Ihara holds himself up. That as was being weird. Ad- yeah. Uh, he, he is an advocate for clean government, good government, and uh, we were relying on him to recognize the inherent conflict of interest. Um, I'm glad that he has faith in, in these individuals, uh, but um, to be, you know, to govern, you need more than just faith. And uh, it's really unfortunate uh, that he decided to vote against reservations. Yeah. Um, I also didn't really appreciate Senator Sloan's comments. Uh, the idea that we get rewarded for our good work with more work <laughs> is really not the way it's meant to be, right? Um, yes, environmental advocates are more empowered than the previous generations, and that is a good thing. That does not mean that uh, we should be responsible for watchdogging government on our free time. Right, right. The volunteers are the ones who are coming out. Volunteers are the ones who are signing petitions, who are reviewing, you know, uh, BLNR staff submittals and asking for uh, freedom of information requests. Um, and that's, we, we really don't want to have that kind of um, acrimonious relationship with your government. Right. But it, um, that apparently seems to be Senator Sloan's vision. It is. And uh, that, that was also okay. But I look forward to the uh, Senate vote on the floor. And that's um, going to be I, next week? Sometime. We don't know. It hasn't been scheduled yet. We have to wait for the committee report. And I have faith in our entire Senate that they uh, will recognize that this candidate lacks basic qualifications for this position and uh, and, hope, and look forward to them voting him down. We look forward also to finding a real good candidate, one that we can all agree yeah. on. How about a wall? <laughs> How about a wall? What, what can people do to... to um, so, so, so the thing is, is now it comes down to every, every Senate. Every senator has a vote. So talk That's to your, your senator. senator. So go online to capital.hawaii.gov. In the upper right corner, you can find out who your senator is. <laughs> right, and if then, you don't know him. If you don't already know it. And then call them. And, you know, you don't, it doesn't have to be a detailed conversation. Just express to them that you are a constituent and that you are watching this vote and you have concerns. And if it gets into a conversation, that's great. But if not, don't worry about it. It's okay. important for the senators to know uh, how their constituents feel. When even if your senator is like Galuteria, which would be like my <laughs> senator, is it even worth it? Yeah, I, th- I think it's, it's important it. for all senators to know. They, if the, any of the committee members up here can change their vote when they get to the floor. Right. So all bets are off. Um, and it's really, it's the, the, now it's the, the, the final horse race to the end. Great. And uh, don't let your horse get traded. <laughs> Great, thank you, Marty. Thank you. I'm, I'm a lot more pissed off about this whole thing than like anybody is like really willing to say. But this is offensive to me that the governor is going to appoint this uh, castle it's and offensive. cook lobbyist. I'm just totally, I'm totally pissed off about this, it's and I, I never that heard capitalism that. Capitalism dominates, you know. Yeah. You know, yeah. corporations dominate in the capitalist economy and. The logic of one dollar, one vote outperforms the logic of one person. Thank you. I'm quoting you, and you're on the Internet.